With the recent episode of the Book of Boba Fett, we were treated to a full 50 minutes of seeing what Din Djarin has been doing since the end of the second season of The Mandalorian. In this episode, we follow him as he makes an attempt to find his place in the galaxy and return to his normal life as a bounty hunter and Mandalorian. However, it has proven to be easier said than done as we see him struggling to get over Grogu and having a difficult time wielding the Darksaber itself that he claimed at the end of the second season from Moff Gideon. Despite this fact, the Darksaber seems to be fighting against Din when he wields it, or perhaps Din is fighting against the Darksaber. We did a video detailing the possibilities of why this is the case, and why Din Djarin may be experiencing some difficulties with the weapon, so if you're interested in finding out more about that, we recommend checking out that video. Today, we hope to gain an understanding of what might come in the coming episodes of Book of Boba Fett, and perhaps Season 3 of The Mandalorian, by taking a look at the long history of the Darksaber itself, starting with its creation back in the Old Republic days, and following Following its journey into the hands of Din Djarin, we will be using canon material, but also linking the gaps by peeking briefly in the Legends continuity when concerning the weapon. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and begin our full timeline of the Darksaber, from creation to now. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a full comprehensive history of where the Darksaber has been, and perhaps where it's headed. The Darksaber's origins began in 1032 BBY, crafted by the Mandalorian Jedi Tar Vizsla. Tar Vizsla is known as the first Mandalorian and only Mandalorian to ever be inducted into the Jedi Order. Back in these days, lightsaber colors varied widely, and many different kinds such as yellow, orange, and cayenne were just as prevalent as other colors that are more prominent now such as green and blue. This was of course before the Jedi became bogged down by dogma, and the crystals only really began to reflect what parts of themselves the Jedi allowed it to, which is why the most common colors are now only green and blue, and the other colors were slowly filtered out. Tar Vizsla's black bladed lightsaber was the first and only of its kind, not only sporting the signature dark blade, but also displaying a flat and more angled design similar to a regular sword, taking into account that of Vizsla's heritage as a proud Mandalorian. It is understandable why his lightsaber would be more unique to his taste of weaponry. We learned in The Mandalorian that the weapon is in fact crafted out of the finest Beskar, merging his two heritages together, the Jedi with the crystal and the blade itself, and his Mandalorian heritage with the hilt. Not much is known about Tarvisla's life other than the fact that he joined all of Mandalore together under this one blade, and was considered the most powerful Mandalorian to have ever lived. A Mandalorian that was loyal to the Creed but walked several paths in life, and hopefully a character that we will learn more about in the soon future. After Tar Vizsla's death, the Jedi kept the Darksaber within their archives with an intent to study it, claiming it for themselves, an act that the Mandalorians took as a major insult. However, during the Old Republic's fall, it was taken by Mandalorians of House Vizsla, who raided the Jedi Temple. The descendants of House Vizsla used the blade to kill many Jedi, as the weapon slowly became a greater symbol of the rightful ruler of Mandalore. For this next part, we will be delving a bit into Legends continuity to better link the past of the Darksaber, as well as explain the rise of Death Watch. Over time, the Darksaber was passed down through the clans for generations, and became responsible for the deaths of many Jedi over many years. Years. By 60 BBY, the Darksaber had come into the possession of Tor Vizsla. Tor Vizsla was a powerful Mandalorian who assembled himself a group of malcontents who represented Jaster Muriel who at the time was the ruling leader of the Mandalorian clans. This group resented their leader as they believed that he attempted to reign in their lifestyles of unaccountability, and Tor Vizsla promised them the downfall of the pacifistic new Mandalorians they so despised so greatly, believing that they were growing weak and that this would soon spell the end of the Mandalorian culture. Tor Vizsla then formed the group known as Death Watch, taking his place as their leader, a secret Mandalore in opposition to both the traditional leader chosen by the warrior clans, as well as the one appointed by the peaceful Mandalorians. Vizsla made the Darksaber a symbol of his authority as a leader, bringing the weapon back to prominence. Vizsla kept ownership of the Darksaber through the Mandalorian Civil War between Death Watch, the new Mandalorians, as well as the old Warrior Way Mandalorians that Death Watch did not agree with, who we will be calling True Mandalorians. However, Vizsla was killed by Jango Fett not long after the end of the Clan Wars, and the Darksaber was passed in the possession of Tor Vizsla's clan kinsman, Pre Vizsla. Now, moving back into canon continuity, 
continuity following the discovery of the rogue Sith Lord Maul and his brother Savage Opress near their camp. Pre Visla, who had recently engaged a Jedi named Obi-Wan Kenobi and revealed that he was the new leader of Death Watch, agreed to an alliance between Death Watch and Maul's Shadow Collective. On Mandalore, following the Shadow Collective's attack on the police, Pre Visla and his Death Watch troopers stepped in to protect against the Collective forces. However, this was actually staged with the intention of overthrowing Duchess Satine's government, who was now the ruler of the new pacifist Mandalorians. Pre Visla used the Darksaber in a staged duel against Savage Opress, and then promptly arrested him. Thanks to his efforts, Pre Visla and Death Watch were hailed as heroes in the eyes of the Mandalorian populace. Visla then betrayed Maul and Oppress and had them imprisoned. After their escape, however, Maul challenged Visla for leadership of Death Watch and the Darksaber itself. Despite putting up an impressive fight with the use of both the Darksaber and his armor's numerous weapons, Visla was disarmed, defeated, and summarily executed by Maul with the Darksaber, thus awarding Maul ownership of the weapon and the rightful leader of Mandalorian. Mandalore. This also represents an important period of time for the Darksaber. As previously to this, the new Mandalorians did not swear allegiance to the wielder of the Darksaber, nor did many true Mandalorians. Now though, with the death of Pre Visla after taking over and conquering Mandalore, this marks the first time in nearly a thousand years that the ruler of Mandalore wielded the Darksaber, and that most Mandalorians bowed to its power and what the Darksaber represents. After Maul lured Kenobi back to Mandalore, Maul used the Darksaber to kill Duchess Satine in front of Kenobi as part of his revenge against the Jedi Master. Afterwards, Maul and Opress were confronted by Maul's former master, a little-known Star Wars character called Darth Sidious, who came to eliminate his former apprentice before he grew more powerful, an indication that even Sidious had heard tale of the Darksaber and what it represented to the Mandalorian creed. Together, Maul and Opress fought Sidious, but they were no match against the greatest Sith Lord that has ever lived. After Opress was killed, Maul drew the Darksaber and wielded it in tandem with his red blade against his former master, but was unable to defeat him. Sidious tossed the Darksaber aside as he subdued and tortured Maul with Force Lightning. Prime Minister Almec recovered the Darksaber following Maul's capture by Sidious fearful of the future of the Mandalorian creeple. After being freed from the prison Sidious kept him in, Maul reclaimed the Darksaber and used the weapon against General Grievous's forces and Magna Guards when they came to Xanbar to attack their base. Maul fought Grievous until his forces were forced to retreat. After Maul returned to Dathomir to help Mother Talzin regain her physical form, Maul was confronted by Sidious yet again, as well as Grievous, as a confrontation ensued at the Knight Brothers' village. Maul, along with Talzin, who had also possessed Dooku, fought Sidious and Grievous. Maul used the Darksaber in the battle until he and Talzin were ultimately overwhelmed. Maul then fled the battle as Talzin sacrificed herself and was killed by General Grievous. It's here where the history of the Darksaber gets slightly more muddled. The Darksaber was still on Dathomir during the reign of the Galactic Empire, kept by Maul in the Night Sisters' lair. Sabine Wren would later use it against Ezra Bridger while she was possessed by the Night Sister spirit. But there's something important to note about this period of time, as Darth Maul apparently stopped using the weapon completely after Mother Talzin was killed. For at this point in time, unspecified reasons, but we do have a theory video coming out later that may explain why Maul ultimately stopped using the Darksaber. After Sabine Wren was possessed, Possessed, Ezra used his lightsaber and the darksaber in tandem to destroy the altar from which the spirits arose. Sabine then picked up the darksaber as she, Ezra, and Kanan Jarrus left Dathomir. A few months later, Sabine, still with the darksaber, ultimately led a mission to Mandalore to rescue her father, Alrich Wren, who was currently in Imperial custody. Sabine wielded the Darksaber during the fight, first at a remote prison and later attacking the convoy taking her father back to Sundari. After the raid, Sabine finally persuaded Bo-Katan to accept the weapon by showing her that the other clans were willing to follow her and stating that the Force had brought the Saber to her so that Sabine could ultimately gift the Darksaber to Bo-Katan and she could lead the Mandalorians into a bright future. This was following Sabine had engaged in a duel with the Mandalorian leader who had previously been loyal to Maul named Gar Saxon, who wanted to be the true leader of Mandalore and believed that by defeating Sabine in single combat and claiming the Darksaber for himself, he could ultimately claim his right to the throne. However, Sabine believed Bo-Katan to be the superior leader, and therefore, after defeating Gar Saxon, gave the Darksaber to Bo, an event that 
many Mandalorians would ultimately frown upon, as Bo-Katan had failed to win the Darksaber in single combat. And while the majority of the Mandalorian creed agreed to follow Bo-Katan into the bright future, a few Mandalorians believed that Bo-Katan receiving the Darksaber so unceremoniously could spell a curse upon their people, an event that would prove pivotal in the history of the Darksaber in the years to come. Bo-Katan, though, accepted the sword in the memory of her sister Satine, and for the honor of her clan and Mandalore itself. After claiming the Darksaber, Bo-Katan would eventually lose the weapon after the Great Purge of Mandalore and the Night of a Thousand Tears, the worst coming to fruition. After the deaths of nearly every single Mandalorian, Moff Gideon was the leader of the last search party on the planet, responsible for locating and killing any Mandalorian survivors. It was here that Moff Gideon would discover the Darksaber, claiming it for himself. By 9 ABY, the galaxy had shifted drastically. The Sith were no longer in command of the Empire or the galaxy as a whole, and Moff Gideon had no rulers to pledge allegiance to. The Empire had somewhat fallen, with only remnants remaining, and a new Republic risen. In 9 ABY, Moff Gideon, who had again participated in the Great Purge of Mandalore and had now fallen into legend, attempted to capture the youngling named Grogu. Din Djarin ultimately located Bo-Katan and Reeves after Moff Gideon successfully captured the young child. With the Mandalorian Din recruiting both Bo-Katan and Reeves to help him rescue the child, having no interest in the Darksaber nor its significance to the Mandalorian culture. However, the Darksaber had been integral in Din Djarin's past even if he did not know it yet. With the Darksaber being unceremonially passed down to Bo-Katan being the ultimate reason why the Mandalorian Creed was falling into obscurity, and why Din Djarin, along with so many other true Mandalorians, were forced to flee the world and fall into the deep corners of the galaxy. Bo-Katan eventually agreed to help Din Djarin, who promised her the Darksaber in return. After a successful raid of Gideon's cruiser by Din Djarin, Bo-Katan, and her associates, Din Djarin defeated Moff Gideon in a duel and wrestled the Darksaber from him. Din Djarin then brought the captured Moff Gideon to the bridge and tried to give the Darksaber to Bo-Katan, but she refused to take it fearful of what happened last time, and fearful of her responsibility for the Night of a Thousand Tears. That is when its origins were revealed to him by Moff Gideon, making Din Djarin the new rightful leader of Mandalore, therefore leading directly into the events of the Book of Boba Fett, Episode 5, and the return of the Mandalorian. Anyway friends, this is the most comprehensive timeline we currently have of the Darksaber and its journey through the galaxy and history of the Blade, a weapon that is over a thousand years old and still in regular use, changing history and turning the tides of war. It will be interesting to watch Din learn how to ultimately wield the weapon and get better at it as it is currently refusing his presence and refusing his will. Anyway though, Acolytes, are you excited to see Din Djarin continue to use the Darksaber as the new rightful ruler of Mandalore? What are your thoughts on this timeline of the Darksaber? As always, my friends, thank you so much for watching, and may the Force be with you.